So this isn't going to, you know, I, I'm really bad. I give a lot of presentations back at home to the universities and the startups and the incubators and all that stuff. And I always come up with a topic pretty quickly. And then I, as I'm actually talking about it, I realize kind of changed my mind on things. So this is not going to be a pro-bootstrapped or pro-raise capital conversation today. Uh, my goal for today is to really share a journey of a SaaS company that started with no money um, 10 years ago to being a market leader today and self-funding and having roughly 150 employees and planning on hiring about 100 more in the next 12 months. That's our story. And so before I get into that story, I'll just give you a kind of a quick rundown on what we do. So we have a SaaS platform in the construction market. And if you think about the construction market as a whole, it's an enormous, absolutely enormous industry. And so within that construction market, we play primarily in the residential construction space. So residential construction would be home building, remodeling, renovating, uh, guy that puts up a fence, the roofer, the plumber, those are all clients of Builder Trend today. That's who we're acquiring, that's who we're marketing to. So we are not selling to somebody that would be building Apple's campus or Google's campus that's building a highway project. That is not our market. But our market's enormous. You know, if you know the bankers all want to know about your total addressable market, our market is enormous. And we love our market. We love our clients. It's pure small business people. We're talking to family run businesses. We're talking to startups in a different fashion. You know, carpenters that become co uh, home builders. Uh, and it, it's, a, it's a great, great place to be in. So what we do is we're basically, you know, we started off as a silo. We're a construction management, project, you know, management, communication tool. Uh, we used to sell it as we're a web-based software. That's what we used to tell people back in, you know, five, ten years ago. Uh, and then we're like more mobile-driven software, and now we're a platform. Uh, so the evolution of what you call yourself is is what's happened to us. So we're now a platform. So we do everything from scheduling. You know, we do payment processing with one of our pa pl platform partners, WePay. We integrate to accounting solutions like Zero and Intuit. Uh, so we're doing a lot of different things within our platform. So when I go to these, you know, being in Omaha, Nebraska, you know, what people think about Silicon Valley, be quite honest with you. They think it's Silicon Valley, and it's just north of LA, and that's where people go to get like breast augmentation surgery. And that's not a joke. And most people don't really know what's going on out here, and most people don't really give a shit what's going on out here, to be quite honest with you, in Nebraska. So, but what we're doing in Omaha is different than what most companies are doing in Omaha. So most companies in Omaha are traditional businesses. Union Pacific, it's a railroad company. There's Mutual of, Unsur uh, Mutual of Omaha. It's an insurance company. And so we're just a little bit different. So people always ask, you know, how did you come up with this cool idea? And you know, you're not Google, but you guys, your office looks like Google's office. And they've obviously never been to a Google office because our office is not nearly this awesome. But we look different, which is pretty cool in Omaha, Nebraska. So part of that is, you know, how'd you start? Well, when I was out of college, my first job was basically with a tech company. I got really lucky. I started with an early SaaS company. It wasn't a SaaS company back in 2003. It was an ASP.NET selling online software to insurance agencies to manage their business. Totally small businesses. It was harder than hell. I used to go to like these insurance conferences in Wichita, Kansas and do like scavenger hunts and weird stuff. And, and that's what that was our business model. I would be on the phone half the time. I'd be out in the marketplace, the marketplace half the time. So I was doing that. My two business partners, my two co-founders, are brilliant. They're like the guys that aced their SAT. They were developing, developing apps in their basement. And apps as in like small business tools. For example, they were both college umpires. Or not college umpires, high school umpires uh, in their spare time when they were in college. So this guy they worked for used to schedule 400 games a week on paper and using his phone. I mean, can you imagine doing that? And one of these guys, one of my partners, Jeff Duggar, who's a self-taught developer, basically said, I think I, re I read this book, and I think, you know, I've been messing around. I think I can develop something for you that would change your life. And the guy goes, I will give you $2,000 if you can do that. And Jeff did it. Like, he knocked it out, and it changed this guy's life. And so they started doing more of this stuff out of their basement, 
And we're really good friends. You know, they're the only ones that owned a house because they're the only ones that, you know, made money. And so we'd hang out and we'd just drink beer and we'd talk about, you know, what could we do together because I apparently had the sales ability. They had the technical development ability. And so we started a software company. And it was like, not revolutionary. It was like, I think we searched like Alta Vista. And we're like, how many home builders are there in the United States? And it said like 45,000 or something or 100,000. And they had this prototype that we put together. And we went to our first meeting on June 27, 2006, to a home builder in Omaha, Nebraska. And we went into his house. He worked out of his house. We showed him what we developed. And he wrote us a check for $4,000 on the spot. So we incorporated the next day because you have to be incorporated to have a bank account, apparently. And so that was the beginning of our journey. And you know, being in Omaha is, is a little different in the sense that you know, information is just not like first to get there. You know, whether it's apparel or skinny jeans or whatever, like we're always figuring it out like a couple years late. So you know, venture capital was not even a term that we were familiar with. Like we didn't know any VCs. There was one growth equity firm in Omaha, and they bought like brick and mortar type buildings or companies. So that was our approach when we started the business. We literally were out to make a profit from day one. We ended up making that profit in our fourth month of business, and we've been profitable at a 14 to 22 percent EBITDA margin since the fourth month. And when it's a cultural thing. You know, you have to focus on that. So this journey of us, and there's kind of these two phases of our business. You know, if you guys are part of a startup now or you're in a more mature business, um, our first phase was, you know, predated that, you know, the app store. You know, it predated the iPhone. It predated uh, really like Twitter and Facebook. We were just out there selling web-based software. And people would give us money up front and typically a setup fee. Like those were the glory days. You could charge like kind of like a normal licensed traditional way. And so that's why that's how we kind of got through. That's how we bootstrapped our way, you know, to where we, you know, we're doing a hundred thousand dollars of monthly recurring revenue essentially in eighteen months. And it was pretty exciting. And we hired all of our friends. Like literally. We hired every single person we knew that hated their job or didn't have a job. And most people tell you that's a horrible strategy, and it totally paid off for us. We got really lucky. Um, in fact, I think most of these guys, I got a picture. It's kind of funny. Give me a second here. It's not working, but I don't know. Can you scroll that down by chance for me? So we you know, started with this internal team, and these are friends that we hired, and we just grinded and Griden, and I've got a picture of Warren Buffett on there because I'm from Omaha, and if you're from Omaha, you see Warren Buffett. And so that team, we had a picture day, so we all dressed up in suits being smart asses. We thought it was really funny to wear a suit to work, and that's our original team. All those guys are still with the company. That picture was taken in 2006. Every single person works there today. They're leaders in our organization. They're freaking awesome. I owe them my entire life. My kids um, owe them a lot, too, because they're going to you know, win off this deal. And they're going to win off this deal. And, and so it's been really exciting. So our focus has completely been sales first. None of those people up there, except for this guy sitting next to me on the right, are developers. We had one developer for five years. One developer. Everybody we hired was revenue. Like sales, 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 sales. And then finally we had so many customers, what happened is, they like actually told us what we had to do with our product, and we got smart. But when that happened, it 2008 came. In 2008, if you guys remember the housing market, uh, it's almost painful for me to talk about because we literally about got wiped out. And we had customers committing suicide. We had customers calling us and crying and telling us they can't pay us and they can't be our customer anymore, but they want to be our customer. And so we had some challenges. You know, there was a point in time where I'm sitting at the conference table and I'm literally in tears and I was begging these guys behind me I'm in tears. And I'm begging them to make 185 calls a day instead of 90 calls a day. And they did it. And we ended up growing the business during the recession. And it was crazy. And what we had to do is we had to make a pretty big 
change in our business because every home builder in America became a remodeler overnight, or they went back to the trade that they originally were into. So, you know, if you think about home builders, a lot of them were a carpenter at one time, or they were a framer at one time, or they were a plumber at one time. And so they all kind of scaled back to their original trade. And so we had to find a way to keep them as customers and adapt to their needs. And it was kind of like the best thing that ever happened to us. Um, we were able to grow through that time. Our product got wider. It got better, um, thanks to Jeff, for the most part. And it, it, it was it was like kind of like the Bubba Gump scene, you know, during the hurricane, like the, their last boat coming through. Well, every competitor that we had up to that point was gone. Like the, everybody that got VC money, like made a pivot and turned into like something completely different and ran as fast as they could. And they, some of them made really good decisions on that, and some made not such good decisions. So fast forward to today, and we're growing really fast. We double our revenue about every 15 to 18 months for the last you know, five years. And it's been really, really exciting. And we've made so many mistakes. I mean, I could stand up here all day and talk to you about the mistakes we've made. And we've done some really good things. And so people, you know, when I'm talking to college kids or other entrepreneurs or our partners, they'll say, what did you do right? And I share this message because I think it's an important message because it's easy to get caught up in all the bullshit. Like, you know, what's, you know, all the KPIs that you read about that everybody tells you to, that you have to live by in the Bible. Well, those are important, but you can, like, get sucked into the KPI world and then you're all of a sudden measuring yourself against some VC's website that tells you you're, you're horrible. And so what we did right was we invested in people. And we made people the absolute priority in our business. And, you know, you think about your core values as a business. Our core value is basically really basic, making people the number one priority. It's not about attaining... 75% revenue growth every year. It's not about attaining churn metrics that you know are outstanding and best of breed. Those are part of it, but we make the investment in the people. People come first. They come before our customers because they make the customers first. And it's this crazy uh, culture that you build. And I know out here in Silicon Valley, you walk in everywhere and you get fed every day and there's ping pong tables. It's all the cliche stuff that you see on TV. And we've totally done that. But I don't know what you don't have out here, potentially, is the loyalty that we have. Nobody ever leaves Builder Trend, for better or worse. Um, and as we get more mature as a company, there are some challenges that come along with that. But as we made our, these people the priority, what's really cool about it, we have this kind of rule of like only hire tens. We have 65 job openings today. And we're not fulfilling them as fast as I'd hope because we have this rule of only hiring tens. And every company should have this rule of only hiring tens. I would assume Google probably only hires tens. And the thought process is, you know, if you hire a ten and they make people a priority and that's their cultural belief, they will pass that on to everybody. And it doesn't matter if you're the CEO, the co-founder, or you're the first guy to work at Builder Trend. It doesn't matter if you're the last guy to work at Builder Trend. Everybody is on pretty much an equal playing field. And the easiest way to get fired at Builder Trend is being a, you know, kind of a mean to someone. And that's the priority of our growth strategy. And it's bizarre that it's working so well. And, and not bizarre because, you know, everybody's doing that. And I'm assuming most companies in Silicon Valley have that same cultural belief. But what's so outstanding about it is people just rally and support each other. And I think as a leader, so there's, you know, I'm looking at the 29 people out there. Uh, you know, some of you have maybe entry-level roles. Some of you guys have middle management roles. Some of you might be CEOs. And it doesn't matter. Like, you have to lean in and do something that's outside your comfort zone every single day. Like, you have to smile at somebody you've never introduced yourself to at your office. And if your company is growing really fast, you should offer to take that new hire out to lunch. And if you're concerned about something, you should go ask the CEO and tell them you're concerned about it. 
And if you are the CEO, you should be constantly asking people to tell you what they're concerned about and tell you the truth and not lie to you. And so that's been our core philosophy. And it's not me being preachy. I hope I don't want to be preachy to anybody. It's not about being VC back. It's not about being in Silicon Valley. It's not about being in Nebraska. Uh, it's about people, in my opinion. And that's why we've been able to bootstrap so far um, this way. So fast forward today, and the business has changed so much. You know, our sales guys that used to have to do, you know, three, four demos to close a deal. You know, 60% of our deals don't even need salespeople anymore, and it changes the model, and they have to adapt to it. And so it's the the new challenge of our future is is being grown up and being mature. And, you know, saying the responsibility of what we have here is a lot bigger than just our fun idea that we had, you know, with these guys and we could dress up and wear suits to be funny. It's, it's serious because these people, what they end up doing is they put their total life, we don't have stock options, by the way, and I always share that because everybody thinks you have to have stock options to start a company, and you probably do out here um, to be successful. Successful. But these people, they don't. They they end up working for us, and they get married, and they buy a new car, and they buy a new house, and they have babies, and you're running a business that they're coming to every day. Bootstrapped or VC backed, it doesn't really matter. And it's the most powerful thing in the world when you see somebody roll in a new car, and they told you to buy a new house, and they had a baby over the weekend. I mean, people do that. <laughs> You're going, wow. And so it's just been a really fun, interesting story. And so we, we get to share this story with our customers. They love it. And we never have shared it in Silicon Valley. I don't know if anybody really gives a shit about Nebraska. Um, my guess is, has anybody been to Nebraska? And so everybody that's been to Nebraska came to the thing today, so I'm glad to see that. Anybody from Nebraska? All right. Well, I'm on an island up here. So... That's our story. And so there's been this really cultural change in Omaha. So one of my friends started a company called Silicon Prairie, which is a news source to track all the stuff that's going on in the Midwest. And there's a general belief by some venture capitalists today that the next 25 years of innovation, dare I say, might not happen here, and it might happen in Omaha, Nebraska, or it might happen in Columbus, Ohio, or it might happen in Pittsburgh. And I think that's pretty exciting. And I think you have to pay attention to the guys you know, in the basement in Des Moines, Iowa, or in Omaha, Nebraska. And so as you're thinking about how do you grow your business through partnerships, as you build out platforms, uh, you know, sometimes look elsewhere than just potentially, you know, TechCrunch and what companies are doing out here. So that's my message today. And it's not a real fancy or elegant message, but I love, do I love sharing what we do, and I think it's uh, fun to tell people about it. So thank you very much.